Hello, Fabio. Okay. Give me a thumbs up there if you can hear me. I know everybody's completing their car stuff. A lot of the car stuff I saw coming in looking great over the weekend. Fabio's yours look great. I imagine your renders are going pretty quick on twin motion, hopefully. You have a graphics card, so I'm sure yours are going fine. Um, let's see. I want to make sure I'm streaming and then I'm also recording. In case this gets taken down later, I can just repost it. Um, okay, good. All right, so where are we going next? We, we did our product visualization here. Uh, we'll take a look at how some of those went. We're going next, we're going to be creating our own title sequence for a show, movie, or game. And we're going to start by storyboarding it. And we're going to be creating a title sequence here and we're gonna look at some example title sequences. And in order to do that, we've gotta to go to absolutely the best place for this. And this is the art of the title. Um, I support these guys on Patreon. That's an amazing compilation of uh, this type of work. Uh, title sequences, you know, sometimes before the movie, sometimes after the movie now. Um, but these are going to be sequences that, you know, uh, ostensibly the purpose here is to uh, let us know who's, you know, acting, directing, writing the movie, uh, and then somehow expanding on the visual language of the film or movie itself. And so when we do this project, um, you can use an existing you know, film, show, or um, game. And that film, show, or game may have an existing um, title sequence, but the purpose of this is not to replicate the existing one. If it does have an existing one, what I want you to do is something different. Uh, take it in a different stylistic direction. Um, Let's look here. Let's talk about the history of title sequences first. These are going to be a really great way for us to really leverage everything we've learned up until now. Um, building everything in um, 3D, perhaps giving it some sort of stylized um, NPR look, depending on the style that you choose. And then... Um, working on our camera motion with some sort of uh, animation happening. And this is something that developed um, with a lot of the Hitchcock films. If we look at some of these, uh, the name that you should write down first is Saul, um, Saul Bass. And if we look at yeah, let's go to here. So uh, Saul Bass essentially is going to be the uh, title designer who originates this idea that in, instead of it just being one card that would show up before the start of the movie, just saying like, here's the title, now here we go. Um, about expanding that one frame into an entire sequence that lets you know who's in the film, and then starts to give you a visual flavor. Um, it's sort of a table setting for what the film will be like. So Saul Bass works with Hitchcock for a bunch of his films. Uh, here we have Vertigo. Let's look at this one. I'll be turning the audio on and off here. And so in films previous to this, you know, we would have the studio, um, identifier 
and then after that there would essentially just be one one card that would be the title of the film here in vertigo we're using animated typography plus um, these close-up shots extreme close-ups in these case right uh, with the characters extreme extreme close-up and then this evolves into a motion graphics sequence right so this is 1958 this is sort of what's possible at this time in 1958 you know, we have this swirling um graphic you know it looks crude by current standards but you gotta remember in 1958 you know we, people had only seen these in front of a a handful a handful of films so uh this sort of you know spirograph ish kind of thing helps to you know create this dizzying effect you know which is part of what's going on in vertigo the idea of uh, something being uh, losing your sense of uh, anchoring your sense of reality um, and you know that's what the film one of the main themes of the film uh, and so this is a uh, one of Saul Bass's more important ones uh, if we look at some of the other ones Vertigo also one of the first we looked at Jaws but Vertigo I think is one of the very first uh, Zolly shots where that's used to um, communicate the let's see here right it's just at the beginning of a sequence where they're going up the stairs And this is a whole bunch. I just want that vertigo shot. This is the one we've talked about. Yeah, so here's the vertigo shot. He's climbing the stairs and looks down. And we get that impression very 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 short because again the cameras are gigantic at the time it takes a lot of work to do that um and so again the idea of disorientation that's what the title sequence is trying to communicate and that's what the zolly shot was communicating there in vertigo let's look at some other saw bass ones so um vertigo and um psycho So again, Saul Bass here, this is not the original, original, yeah, originally in um, black and white. Uh, and if we look at this one, this is definitely more of a motion graphics approach. We don't have a lot of, we don't have any footage in this one, but the idea of the typography itself being cut up, right, which is obviously related to the uh, stabbing that happens in Psycho, uh, something being fractured. So, I mean, there's the cutting up of the type and then also the, the idea of a, of a psyche being shattered or split up or cut. So again, this is even, uh, this is 1968, right? So again, this is, looks crude by current standards, but, you know, in tremendous amount of work to make this happen at the time. And so Psycho, another one of Saul Bass here. Let's pull this up. Um, yeah, so Art of the Title, just an amazing resource. This is a really good um, description of uh, some of the history surrounding Saul Bass. Um, let's look, we have Psycho, Vertigo, um, North by Northwest, 
So here, um, where are we? This is 1959, right? So in between the two other films, uh, in North by Northwest, again, confusion, uh, reflection. And so using this motion graphics overlay to uh, create this grid that then is revealed to be you know, the side of the building. And we see that reality is kind of fractured here or distorted, which is a lot of what's happening in North by Northwest, a man trapped in a story he doesn't quite understand. Um, not this, these title sequences are not that long, but they are uh, the first of their kind. It can't be understated, you know, how important this work is, and all of the work that comes later here is incredibly, you know, owes a debt of gratitude in that, you know, more than just throwing the title North by Northwest up and then starting the movie, we have a whole sequence that really sets the table. I personally like it when they're before the film, you know, that really gives you the flavor of what's happening in the film without always having to be stylistically related to the visual style of the film. Now, um, this, if we go back and look at some of Saul Bass's other work, um, he continues to work for a long time. One thing, if we look at some, you know, he's doing this at the very beginning of doing it, um, creating these title design. Uh, later on, if we look at, you know, what's a later film uh, for him, you know, Casino, um, the um, Scorsese film here, here, creating sort of a f abstract feel of motion graphics with the uh, by using uh, older style Vegas lights as um, the backdrop to what's happening after we get past the explosion there. So we have these close ups turning, you know, close ups of these lights into abstract backgrounds that set the table for putting all the titles, who's in the movie, who's directing, so on and so forth. These examples here, you know, we're using motion graphic style, more abstract imagery in the background. Let's see how, um, so that's, you know, what the title sequence does. Saul Bass, um, this in his other sequences, you know, this is the beginning of this idea. Um, you'll see that many, many of these uh, title sequences can be experimental in a way that the film uh, or the movie or the game is not. Uh, let's look at some here that we're creating using some more modern techniques. And so let's come in and look at, um, we looked at West, that sequence from Westworld. Let's look at the Westworld titles, because I think this is a good example of using 3D in a very cinematic way. And so if we look at this, let's make some notes about the camera techniques here, right? So this one in particular, I think, can be a good model for the kind of work we can do here. Um, you know, we can use twin motion now to get a high quality render and really play with the light and the depth of field. And we have a series of shots here, you know, that they're representational and that we can usually make out what's happening. But a lot of times we're very close up. Uh, a lot of times we have you know, sort of very minimal animation. Objects are moving slightly, you know, not that much character animation. Um, you know, we have the piano playing there in this example, but in many of the shots, we are essentially leaning on a lot of our cinematography techniques, pulling focus, 
very slow linear camera motion and then very selective use of light to create a lot of contrast uh, and really well balanced frames that allow you to present the type really clearly in setting the tone for what's going on here, right? So this one is as a particular narrative function in that uh, this is about, you know, some sort of synthetic robot beings and we're kind of seeing the process of them being manufactured here to some extent combined with the metaphor of the player piano, right? Something that is this, you know, ostensibly human activity, and then sort of taken over by a machine. This is a player piano reel, the kind of things that you would feed into a player piano to actually trigger it. And so um, notice the very controlled use of color here. Um, this, this is a great one. Uh, the studio responsible for this, Elastic and Patrick Clare. Um, these are both uh, studios to keep in mind. And Raul Marx, these are three great names. The other great thing about the art of the title is that this is all indexed. And so we can look at like, what else has Raul Marx done? Um, and so he's uh, an amazing title designer. He's done a lot of different title design. One other one to check out here which um, is a great combination of live action. And this is live action shots that are being composited together here. So if we look at the first season True Detective titles, here, um, this one's, this would be something that we could achieve here by sort of overlaying different layers and renders. Um, so this would be a process that sort of started uh, in a render and then uh, transferred to uh, After Effects for more compositing. So just really, really amazing work here using collage technique and masks to uh, create these composite images, collaged images that just look great. In this case, it's being done with real world footage, uh, but could easily be also combined with CG techniques uh, for the individual renders coming together. So all the True Detective title sequences uh, are just visually beautiful. If you look at the season two one, also really great. Um, this one, maybe, a little bit more intense. We're still doing this collage, but this part of the show was about California. And so there's a lot of uh, this sort of top-down uh, drone or helicopter imagery of the California landscape composited with some of our main characters. A lot of really, really great, beautiful frames. And they picked a series of really evocative soundtracks for each of these. So that was one, two, and here's three. And so all of these would be positing techniques here, putting certain things together. Great. There's so much to explore here. Let's look at let's look at some of the other 
antibody ones. Um, peripheral. If you look at their site, I think in addition to Not for sure they had done. Yeah, so here's another one. I remember this one in particular. One of the Tom Clancy games. And so depending on the style that you choose for your title sequence, it may change your workflow considerably, right? So this is sort of the trailer slash title sequence intro for this game. You know, more of a motion graphics approach here. Let's look at the rendering something out of twin motion and then processing it is certainly an option. If we look at the Spider-Verse sequences. So all sorts of options here. You see we've got an entire, if we look at some of these, we've got an entire, you know, clearly related to the visual style of the film, but building on that, being experimental with these in a way, that even this film, which, you know, is visually experimental, is not really doing. So sort of flying through here. It's a great one. And yeah, this one, Man in the High Castle. So combination here again, where we're putting all sorts of things together. Yeah, we have some sort of renders coming out of Cinema 4D or Twin Motion, and then overlaying some footage on top of this, making it look as if it's projected. But the amount of objects we have access to in Twin Motion and the way we can build out complete scenes there really makes this, I think, a more interesting project.
notice the camera motion here, right? We're not zooming. We're moving the camera, if at all, very slowly, getting these cinematic, well-composed, moving stills. So our work here at the beginning is that we're going to take this one in several steps. We're going to storyboard first. All of our shots, we're going to say we're going to do at least 10 shots here. Then we're going to go from storyboard to style frames. Our style frames are going to be essentially our storyboard shots, but like another still that's going to have um, that's going to have the as close as we can the look and feel of what it is that we want to get to on this. And so for this week, we're going to be doing the storyboard. And considering what is the movie, film, um, TV show, or game we want to focus on, and what can we do there? Um, this is a good one in that we're using you know some images from uh, that are re that are somehow relevant to the story, right? So uh, I haven't read this book, but it's you know like an alternative history of what if. Uh, the Allies had lost World War II, and uh, so we have this uh, a lot of imagery that's uh, American iconic, iconic American imagery, and then uh, you know iconic Nazi imagery, and how things might have played out uh, differently, right? So like the Statue of Liberty and the eagle, and then you know, these projections of uh, the the Axis powers, the, the Japanese and the Germans, uh, their imagery over top of some of these things, like how history might have played out differently. This is a really great approach um, in that we're not showing all of the main characters. We're picking some aspect of that to really, really focus on. Um, the Westworld one. We didn't see all the Westworld characters we that is a formula for these things but it's not one i'm encouraging you to follow and i don't think it's particularly fruitful right the tv version of this like if we looked at uh a typical tv one i don't even know if they're on here because it's not um we'll just look online smartphone title sequence so, right so the way this thing typically plays out on television once we get past this Aspen Dental commercial, is that you, know, you just have the title and then usually the... Uh, finally. Usually the character that we're looking at, uh, you know, it's their name and their picture. This is, f you know, a definitely a more typical television, a more pedestrian approach to doing this kind of thing. And I'm encouraging you to stay away from this approach. We're taking a more abstracted approach here where what is, you know, the non, because you know, we're not going to be spending a whole bunch of time doing a bunch of character modeling and character uh, animation. We're working more at the directorial level. What is something that we could do um, that... Looks at the message and underlying themes of the show, and builds off of that. Um, this one's particularly good. The severance, right? So about being trapped in a you know corporate-ish sort of job, uh, and. Part of what makes this work is, you know, some of these strange applications of animation to 
some of the characters. The character is not designed to be photorealistic here, so they're going for like a very specific kind of NPR um, rendering. And a lot of deformation of the body. Part of what makes this look experimental is the isometric long lens. Makes a lot of these scenes look and seem toy-like. This, you know, had a lot of procedural animation in it. But the idea of like slowly moving through a scene here is particularly useful. Great use of light and composition. I think this is mostly one continuous shot. I would also discourage you from planning to do that. We definitely want to cut from transition to transition. Right, so that show, you know, it's about a effective fungus that's, um, uh, you know, causing Armageddon. Uh, uncut gems. This one. Uh, for man. It's in, uh, tied up in this uh, scheme surrounding auctioning off uh, rare gemstones. But the title sequence here sort of dials into the world of the gem in this kind of abstract landscape. Right, you're not really sure is it the inside of the gem or inside of a person. Uh, really great. Uh, the Game of Thrones one, I imagine a lot of you are familiar with. You know, it's exploring like a miniature of Game of Thrones. A lot of this, I believe we do cut. It's not all one, yeah. It's not all one shot. Again, using the shallow depth of field. And there's a lot of intricate modeling here, but just thinking about setting something like this up in miniature, you know, the long lens would help to communicate that quite a bit. There's so much to explore here in terms of looking for interesting styles. And I think a good formula for this project is, you know, finding a style that really speaks to you that is not the style of the original title sequence if there is a title sequence for the show or movie or game. Um, a good formula here is selecting some sort of contrasting style to whatever the current one is, as if there is one, um, and then uh, applying that uh, to whatever it is that, that you've selected. As your subject. The James Bond movies are great here um, in terms of creating this kind of imagery. Um, in terms of more elemental components here to keep in mind would be uh, perhaps using fire and other components later on in the composite. We're not going to be generating a lot of fire necessarily in uh, our renders. It's going to be super, super, super time consuming. But we're pretty good here. So let's do a couple examples um, real quick. Right, so um, I'll try to select a few things here, right? So something like this. Um, 
let's say that it's instead of a let's start simple so for instance let's say i'm doing something um a new title sequence for cleopatra right the classic movie i'm not sure if there is yeah okay this is great All right so the original one here i think this is a particularly fruitful creative strategy right this is um the original one is very, uh, when is this, 1963, right? So not that long after the very first ones we were looking at. Not really much of something by um, modern standards, right? And so this is uh, some of the, I would imagine it was probably some of the pre-visualization art. But um, we could focus on these Egyptian, this Egyptian imagery and sort of give it the uh, Westworld treatment, right? With some very dramatic lighting. And yeah, let's see what we can bring in here. So let's look. at some of the imagery from the original movie. Elizabeth Taylor. She's very persuasive. And the, you know, the way that Egypt is portrayed at the time. Yeah, you know, so much of the super ornate Egyptian artifacts. This is certainly something we might be able to incorporate here. So let's think about Egyptian imagery and Egyptian artifacts. And let's see what we can put together here. Uh, I'm going to clear out some of the stuff I have in here, which is not particularly interesting. Yeah, so I think something here, we're going to use some rocks maybe here as our starting points and lay some of the, what we can find from our Egyptian artifacts out in these objects we have here. And so maybe grabbing several of these that we can put together.
something with some foreground and some background to it. Be great to put some pyramid in the background. Let's see if we have a pyramid that could work. So, you know, we don't have an Egyptian pyramid, but something. In the neighborhood. We can see in the background our shots, right? So something like that. And then maybe if we come in with some sort of brick. Not masonry brick. There we go. Under UV, our scale. I need to come right down and probably No, it's not quite right. I like the other one better. Let's see if we can, if we, anything we have under stone.
And that's the best. That's not too bad. Cool. All right. So I've got some sort of scene here now in which I might be able to start doing some different things with some Egyptian artifacts. If we just type in Egypt. Let's see what we have. So if you're using things from Sketchfab to come in from here, make sure you're keeping track of who to attribute it to in your credits for your title sequence. That came in just way too large. Remember from Sketchfab, things may be cool. Now we don't want to get too close. Things will sort of break down at that point. But let's just th think about we're not too worried about the individual layout right now. We're just trying to come up with some interesting compositions using some of those techniques that we saw. Right, so this could be our Cleopatra title sequence where we're seeing finding something dynamic, foreground, background. Um, and somebody was asking about the camera. Let's come in and save this one. And saving our camera shots here as individual. Create a new camera shot there. Making sure to update my camera position there.
and here. I want this to seem large and imposing. So I might bring the focal length to like 24. And bring this down like so. So you can essentially save your camera position down here. I like that. I don't love it. Let's It's very large. There we go. So this is getting towards something where I'm going to call this now a style frame, right? I went from the idea, sort of a rough storyboard, and then here we are at style frame. I'm not, you know, some sort of very minimal camera animation here. Maybe a little bit of more moody volumetric lighting. Let's see something. So I'm updating this to make sure I store it down here. There we go. Get back to it there. There we go. Kind of a desert at night kind of look.
All right. I like this. This might be might be on something here. I'm trying to set it up so that the again, I wanted this to seem large and imposing, right? And so I like this shot a lot. Let's go ahead and save that there. This would be a good style frame here for the first um, one. As far as recording your style frames, you could go through the rigmarole of rendering them out here, or we could just go through the um, screenshotting them this way and bringing them in. Um, once you have a good camera shot here, make sure you hit plus so that now you can make sure that this one's saved here, this camera position, and move on to another shot over here, right? So again, um, definitely rule of thirds works great on these sh these kind of projects because we have some sort of visual focal point, and then that gives us the other third to eventually uh, put the typography in there. But, you know, this is establishing my theme. I'm sort of getting the look and feel of it down. Um, think about what other sort of um, objects I might be able to work with here. You know, we can just iterate so quickly on these things here. Yeah, things coming from Sketchfab, a lot of times they seem very, very large. Quite large. Maybe something moves over top of this. So let's move this over here, like so. Maybe sort of embedded in the rock. We need more rock here. This would be a great sort of camera roll here. Let's make sure that we save this one, not there, but here. We're going to need more rock. You know, shift drag this over this way. Fill in more rock that way. Let's take this one and maybe adjust our. camera to a longer length. Yeah, some sort of camera roll here. I think this needs to be a bit bigger. Trying to always scale proportionally. Uh, and you see how the detail speaks at this size? And so you don't want to scale it up too much because it definitely doesn't quite hold up. It looks a little bit blurry at that size.
and maybe there's some coins on the rock. So it's a gold coin material. I'm not a historian. I think they're using coins around this time, but sure. Right, and so now we could populate. There's certainly a lot of gold in the film. I uh, might be able to paint them here. Let's see if we can do that. If we go to populate. This should project them down. It gives you this weird triangle view. I'm just projecting them down like this. And if we get out of paint mode, yeah, we have some on there. All right, this would be another good style frame. Something top-down-ish like this. I like that one. Make a new one here. So I've got this shot, this shot. Now over here. So I'm putting together some style frames, right? Um, starting to think about camera motion, but starting to put this together. Um, so storyboard, and then these would be a set style, a set of style frames, right? So the style frames are kind of like uh, you're trying to pre-visualize the final product as much as you can. Um, you know, now I want something, there's going to be multiple pyramids, right? So I want that in the background for sure. Making multiple pyramids. Nice and easy.
And yeah, I'm building my set out here. So depending on how big, it's a very large model, um, this is. Thank you, Fabio. Hmm, I like that. Get the reflection. In fact, maybe for this shot. Saving the camera position down here.
I think that might be great for that shot. Yeah. Yeah, we can just get so many interesting compositions happening very quickly here. Let's put that one in there. Cool. So I've got three pretty good style frames. Nice. Um, focusing on objects, but there's going to be sort of, you know, minimal animation happening per shot. We're focusing more on tone, lighting, camera movement, putting the scene together, which is going to work. Um, yeah, I think this might, this might be interesting. I like this blue and orange thing I have going on. I like this one. Uh, this is a particularly, I think, a good, uh, we've done this in the past where I've given everybody the same movie. I'll let you guys pick your own thing this time. But an older film where, you know, it was done before, this type of title sequence was a standard thing might be a really interesting way to go about doing this right so this cleopatra a rich story rich visually the film but um there's no existing title sequence to sort of move away from right the point is not to find one that you like and remake it i want you to put your own style on uh an existing film game tv show making sense fabio you're still on there anybody else on the live stream do you have any ideas for a film that might be interesting to you So not only is the camera position saved with each shot here, but the um, all of the ambient settings are changed. So I can have the water on here, but not here. Cool. All right, I'll throw together another example with a little bit more of an NPR look on Wednesday when we look at everybody's work from the weekend, but this is a good starting point, I think, for where we want to go with this.
Cool. All right. So we went from storyboard idea, film idea to style frames here, which is great. Cool. This is going to be a good start. And we'll get going from there. Awesome. Uh, I look forward to seeing everybody's additional work on Wednesday.